The Science of Mind, a complete course of lessons in the science of mind and spirit by Ernest Holmes, 1926 edition, excerpt number one. Nothing happens by chance. Nothing in the universe happens by chance. All is in accordance with law, and the law of God is as omnipresent as is the Spirit of God. This law is a law of mind, but back of the law is the word. Quote, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Unquote. Back of our lives is the law of our being, and through that law runs the word which we speak. For, quote, What things soever he, the Son, seeth the Father do, these also doeth the Son likewise. Unquote. Many are waking up to the facts. Thousands of people today are beginning to realize this and put it into operation, and the results attained would fill more books than one man could read in a lifetime. Thousands today are using the silent power of mind to heal their bodies and bring prosperity into their affairs. And the law is always working in accordance with the belief of those seeking to use it. As the universe is run by an infinite mind, so man's life is controlled by his thinking. Ignorance of this keeps him in bondage. Knowledge will set him free. One by one, people will investigate the truth and put it into operation. And the time will come when disease and poverty will be swept from the face of the earth, for they were never intended to be. They are simply the byproducts of ignorance, and enlightenment alone will erase them. The time has come to know the truth. The hour of freedom has struck. The bell of liberty is ringing, and, quote, let him that is a thirst come, unquote. Let us, then, plunge more deeply into our own natures and into the nature of the universe and see if we shall not find treasures undreamed of, possibilities never imagined, and opportunities which the fond thought yearning for freedom has often, in our vision of the greater life, given us. Quote, Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it, unquote. A wonderful experiment. It would be a wonderful experiment for anyone to make to begin to live as if this promise were true, to talk, think, and act as though there were a limitless power attending him on his journey through life, as though his every act were directed and guided into expressions of peace, health, happiness, and harmony. It is surely worthwhile, and understanding will make the way so clear before us that we shall some day come to see the logic of it, and then indeed shall we really begin to live. Our lives fortunes, and happiness are in our own hands to mold as we will, provided we first obey the law and learn how to make conscious use of it. Quote, with all thy getting, get understanding. Unquote. An old adage, but today as true as ever. It has been the teaching of all times that man reproduces the divine nature, and if he does, we shall expect to find in his nature the same qualities that we suppose must be in the nature of life itself. What Psychology Teaches About Man's Nature A study of the psychological nature of man verifies the belief in, quote, the Trinity, unquote, running through all life. Man is self-conscious. Of this we are sure, for he can say, quote, I am, unquote. 
This fact alone proves his claim to immortality and greatness. In psychology, we learn that man is threefold in his nature. That is, he has a self-conscious mind, a subconscious mind, and a body. In metaphysics, we learn that the three are but different attributes of the same life. Man's self-conscious mind is the power with which he knows. It is, therefore, one with the Spirit of God. It is, indeed, his only guarantee of conscious being. The self-knowing mind. It is from this self-knowing mind that man is able to realize his relationship with the whole, for without it he would be unhuman and most certainly not divine. But since he has it, he must be divine. It is the self-knowing mind alone that constitutes reality, personality, and individuality. It is the, quote, image of God, unquote, the essence of sonship and the, quote, personification of the infinite, unquote. Man's unity with the whole. We recognize then in man's self-knowing mind his unity with the whole. For while a drop of water is not the ocean, yet it does contain within itself all the attributes of the limitless deep. Man's self-knowing mind is the instrument which perceives reality and cognizes or realizes truth. All illumination, inspiration, and realization must come through the self-knowing mind in order to manifest in man. Vision, intuition, and revelation proclaim themselves through man's self-knowing mind, and the saints and sages, the saviors and Christ's, the prophets and seers, the wise and learned, have all consciously perceived and proclaimed this fact. Every evidence of human experience, all acts of kindness and mercy, have interpreted themselves through man's self-knowing mind. All that we know, say, or think, feel, or believe, hope, or long for, fear or doubt is some action of the self-knowing mind. Subjective memories we have, and inner unexpressed emotions we feel, but to the self-knowing mind alone does realization come. Without this capacity to consciously know, man would not exist as an expressed being and, so far as we are concerned, would not exist at all. The self-knowing mind of man proclaims itself in every thought, deed, or act, and is truly the only guarantee of his individuality. Man, a center of God consciousness. With this vast array of facts at our disposal, it would be foolish to suppose that man's self-knowing mind is any other than his perception of reality. It is his unity with the whole, or God, on the conscious side of life, and is an absolute guarantee that he is a center of God consciousness in the vast whole. Unity with Law we will say, then, that in spirit man is one with God. But what of the great law of the universe? If we are really one with the whole, we must be one with the law of the whole, as well as one with the spirit. Again, psychology has determined the fact to be more than a fancy. The characteristics of the subconscious mind of man determine his subjective unity with the universe of life, law, and action. 
The subjective obeys the objective. In the subjective mind of man, we find a law obeying his word, the servant of his spirit. Suggestion has proved that the subconscious mind acts upon our thought without question or doubt. It is the mental law of our being and the creative factor within us. It is unnecessary at this point to go into all the details of the subjective mind and its mode of action. It is enough to say that within us is a mental law working out the will and purposes of our conscious thoughts. This can be no other than our individual use of that greater subjective mind, which is the seat of all law and action, and is, quote, the servant of the eternal spirit through all the ages, unquote. Marvelous as this concept may be, it is none the less true that man has at his disposal in what he calls his subjective mind, a power which seems to be limitless. This is because he is one with the whole on the subjective side of life. Man's thought, falling into his subjective mind, merges with the universal subjective mind and becomes the law of his life through the one great law of all life. There are not two subjective minds. There is but one subjective mind, and what we call our subjective mind is really only the use that we are making of the one law. Each individual maintains his identity in law through his personal use of it, and each is drawing from life what he thinks into it. To learn how to think is to learn how to live, for our thoughts go into a medium that is infinite in its ability to do and to be. Man, by thinking, can bring into his experience whatsoever he desires if he thinks correctly and becomes a living embodiment of his thoughts. This is not done by holding thoughts, but by knowing the truth. The body. But what about man's body? Is that too one with the body of the universe? Let us briefly analyze matter and see what it really is. We are told that matter is not a solid, stationary thing, but is a constantly flowing, formless substance which is forever coming and going. Matter is as indestructible as God, as eternal as timeless being. Nothing can be either added to or taken away from it. The very bodies we now have were not with us a short time ago. As Sir Oliver Lodge says, we discard many of them on the path through this life, for the material from which our bodies are composed is in a constant state of flow. Vistas of thought open up along the lines of mental healing when we realize this fact. Later, we will thoroughly discuss and work out a definite technique for the purpose of healing. Matter is not what we thought it to be. It is simply a flowing stuff taking the form that mind gives it. How about the matter from which other things than the body are made? It is all the same. One substance in the universe takes different forms and shapes and becomes different things. Last stages of matter. The last analysis of matter resolves it into a universal ether and leaves nothing more than a stuff which may be operated upon. Matter, in the last analysis, is composed of particles so fine that they are simply supposed to be. In other words, it disappears entirely, and the place where it once was is again, quote, without form and void, unquote. Matter, as we know it, is only an aggregation of these particles arranged in such an order 
as to produce definite forms which are determined by something which is not material. There is no difference between the particles which any one form takes and the particles which all forms take. The difference is not in the minute particles, but in their arrangement. The unity of all body. Our bodies are one with the whole body of the universe. Seeds, plants, cabbages, and kings are made of the same substance. Minerals, solids, and liquids are made from the primordial substance which is forever flowing into form and forever flowing out again into the void. The formless and the formed. Nothing could form a formless stuff which has no mind of its own except intelligence operating upon it. Again, we come back to the Word as the starting point of all creation. God's Word is the great world. Man's Word is the small world. One Spirit, one mind, and one substance. One law, but many thoughts. One power, but many ways of using it. One God in whom we all live and one law which all operate. One, one, one. No greater unity could be given than that which is already vouchsafed to mankind. But why is man so limited? Why is he still poor, sick, afraid, and unhappy? Because he does not know the truth. That is the only why. But why was he not made so that he would have to know the truth? The answer is that even God could not make a real man, that is, a real personified expression of himself, without creating him in freedom and leaving him to discover himself. This is the meaning of of the story of the prodigal son and the whole meaning of it. Individuality means self-choice. Individuality means real individualized being and real personified self-choice. We could not imagine an individuality without self-choice. And what would be the use of self-choice unless the ability to choose were backed with the power to externalize that choice? It would remain simply an idle dream, never coming into real self-expression. A little thought will make it clear that if man is created to express freedom, he must be left to discover himself. Of course, during the process, He will have much experience, but in the end, he will come out a real being. The day of man's discovery of himself marked the first day of the record of human history on this planet. And from the day when he first made this discovery, he has constantly risen and continuously progressed. All the forces of nature attend him on his way but he must first discover them in order to make use of them. The greatest discovery ever made. The greatest discovery that man ever made was that his thought has creative power. That is, that it uses creative power. His thought of itself would have no power unless it were operative through a creative medium. We do not have to compel law to operate. All that we have to do is to use it. The law of mind is just like any and all other laws of being. It simply is a complete unity. We have now discovered a unity with the whole on all three sides of life or from all three modes of expression. 
we are one with all matter in the physical world, one with the creative law of the universe in the mental world, and one with the spirit of God in the conscious world. What more could we ask or hope for? How would it be possible for more to be given? We could ask for no more, and no greater freedom could be given. From now on, we will expand, grow, and express only to the degree that we consciously cooperate with the whole.